Hey, hello everybody. This is uh, Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, tonight we're continuing in our study of the book of James, and we're going to pick up in uh, chapter 34 tonight. Uh, if you did not watch the previous episodes on James, I, I hope you will go back and watch this all from the beginning. Uh, let me ask Brother Eric to say hi to everybody before we get started. Hello, everybody. It's me again, the homo. Okay. Look closely now. <laughs> Back to you. All right. Well, let me let me say before we get started. Uh, I think it was. I think it was this morning. Uh, I saw someone post a video and make a comment on on a video about uh, Job. And uh, this brother was uh, complaining that Job was so difficult to understand and other people were making comments and saying the same thing. It's hard to understand. And I, I don't, I don't think it's hard to understand. I, I, I think as we're going through this, it's very, very clear what's going on. And uh, it, it's, it's just very exciting to really study it, it thoroughly. Uh, uh, so it, it, I would just say that if you're one of these people that uh, has a hard time understanding Job, uh, I think it's pretty clear and simple to understand, and I hope you go watch this series from the beginning. Brother, what do you have to say about that? Do you think this is a difficult book, or is it pretty clear? Well, your head must be in the clouds, because it's pretty, pretty difficult for us here down on the earth. <laughs> earth to Brother Luke. <laughs> Okay, but I, I highly recommend you go back over and watch them again because, uh, oh boy, after the second time, it really makes sense. Okay, back to you. Okay, well, let's continue on. And I know you like to play the game of uh, guess the title. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read the chapter 34 in the KJV. And then I want you to listen carefully, and then I want you to, to tell me how you would title it, what title you would give to this chapter. And then I'll divulge what the title is in the Amplified Version, because they put titles for each chapter, and, and, and see if they come to the same conclusion that you do on the title. Um, and then we'll go through it verse by verse in the Amplified verse slowly. Okay, so here goes, chapter 34. Furthermore, Elihu answered and said, Hear my words, O ye wise men, and give ear unto me, ye that have knowledge. For the ear trieth words, as the mouth tasteth meat. Let us choose to, uh, choose to us judgment. Let us know among ourselves what is good. For Job hath said, I am righteous, and God hath taken away my judgment. Should I lie against my right? My wound is incurable without transgression. What man is like Job, who drinketh up scorning like water, which goeth in company with the workers of iniquity, and walketh with wicked men? For he hath said, It profiteth a man nothing that he should delight himself with God. Therefore, hearken unto me, ye men of understanding, far be it from God that he should do wickedness, and from the Almighty that he should commit iniquity. For the work of a man shall he render unto him, and cause every man to find according to his ways. Yea, surely God will not do wickedly, neither will the Almighty pervert judgment. Who hath given him charge over the earth? Or who hath disposed the whole world? If he set his heart upon man, if he gather unto himself his spirit and his breath, all flesh shall perish together, and man shall turn again unto dust. If now thou hast understanding, hear this, hearken to the voice of my words. Shall even he that hateth right govern? And wilt thou condemn him that is most just? Is, is it fit to say to a king, thou art wicked? And to princes, ye are ungodly? 
how much less to him that accepteth not the persons of princes, nor regardeth the rich more than the poor, for they all are the works of his hand. In a, in a moment shall they die, and the people shall be troubled at midnight, and pass away, and the mighty shall be taken away without hand. For his eyes are upon the ways of man, and he seeth all his goings. There is no darkness, nor shadow of death, where the workers of iniquity may hide themselves. For he will not lay upon man more than right, that he should enter into judgment with God. He shall break in pieces mighty men without number, and set others in their stead. Therefore, he knoweth their works, and he overturneth them in the night so that they are destroyed. He striketh them as wicked men in the open sight of others, because they turned back from him and would not consider any of his ways, so that they caused the cry of the poor to come unto him, and heareth the cry of the afflicted. When he giveth quietness, who then can make trouble? And when he hideth his face, who then can behold him? whether it be done against a nation or against a man only, that the hypocrite reign not, lest the people be ensnared. Surely it is meet to be said unto God, I have borne chastisement, I will not offend any more. That which I see not teach thou me, if I have done iniquity, I will do no more. Should it be according to thy mind? He will recompense it, whether thou refuse or whether thou choose, and not I. Therefore, speak what thou knowest. Let men of understanding tell me, and let a wise man hearken unto me. Job hath spoken without knowledge, and his words were without wisdom. My desire is that Job may be tried unto the end because of his answers for wicked men. He added, uh, he, for he addeth rebellion unto his sin. He clappeth his hands among us and multiplieth his words against God. Uh, now, I would have to say something in the title would be something about God's judgment. Anything in the title about God's judgment? The title, according to the Amplified, is Elihu Vindicates God's Justice. Oh, that's what I meant to say, justice. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Well, I get your point, and you got you got the gist of his his uh, his argument. And I don't really see any difference in his argument uh, than than that he just made. Uh, compared to the arguments of the three friends that he criticized because they did a, he said they didn't do a good job of, of accusing and, and uh, uh, Job and causing Job to see the light, you know. Uh, he thinks he can do a better job of accusing him, convicting him. Uh, so he's really saying the same thing, that Job is wicked, he deserves it, it's God's justice, but he's adding one thing to to the, the accusation, and that is on, on top of all your sin and the you, and wickedness, you, you you deserve all these things. But on top of it all, you you're even um, um, blaming God, saying God is unjust because you don't deserve it. Now, so that's to me uh, the sum. Of, of the arguments of, from the three friends and also Elihu, that's all there's, there's been saying against Job, and Job has continued to answer. Each time that he's, he's accused, he answers, uh, it's not what you say. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not guilty, and yet I'm being afflicted. And, and But Job is not willing to admit because he doesn't believe it's true. He's not willing to admit that uh, his punishment, or that he, he thinks this punishment is coming from God, and, and that he deserves it. He do, he's not willing to admit he deserves it because he believes he's a, an innocent, righteous man. And uh, so the, the real confusion because that Job has and all of his accusers, the real confusion 
comes about from the fact that none of them understand what's really going on. None of them were there when Satan went before God and they made their agreement. So if they, if they understood what was really going on, all these accusations of Job against Job, uh, you know, they could, they would, should be able to understand that it, it, Job's not being punished because he's wicked. God said he was righteous. He's being punished not by God. He's being punished by Satan. And, and God is allowing it, but God is not saying Job deserves it. Uh, Satan is determined to afflict him until he says, God, uh, you know, I, I don't believe in you. I don't love you. And, and I curse you. That's what Satan is attempting to get out of Job and he's failing. But Job is well, I'm confused too, because Job thinks that it's God. He doesn't know that about the arrangement. He doesn't know that it's Satan. He doesn't know that he's being, he's being afflicted and not because he he's guilty. He, 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 he keeps on claiming his innocence. He's holding on to that that confidence that he's innocent. Okay, before we go through it verse by verse, that's kind of like the my condensed thought of, of all their charges against him and the fact that they're just all ignorant about what's really going on. And I think this is the problem when people say they don't understand the book of Job. They don't understand this either, that you have to understand this in the context of the first two chapters when Satan and God make this agreement. Okay, brother, let me hear, hear your response to that, and then I'll, I'll go through it in the uh, Amplify. Okay, I'm in agreement with you on uh, Elihu's... Uh, uh, it was no different from the others, uh, in our opinions. Uh, so there, it was no... Oh, it, Maybe we're missing something. That's why we need Stephen here. Uh, maybe he would understand what Elihu was thinking. Uh, looked the same to me, though. Okay. Now, uh, that was a great overview. Yes. Uh, do you really think that people don't understand Job because they don't understand what took place the first two chapters? And it seems like Job's culture didn't have a... Uh, concept of the enemy satan uh does that hold true throughout the whole book of job uh back to you well i i think you're uh you nailed it right there it, it, it's it's the, they're under the under the uh, belief that that uh bad things happen to you because you're wicked and God is punishing you. You're being, uh, you're being uh, afflicted by God because you deserve it, and God is chastising you. Now we know that there is a doctrine that we read in the Book of Hebrews that says that if you're a child of God, when you put your faith in God, you become a child of God, and and God does chastise His children. Um, it, it's just like any person that has children, uh, if, if they get out of line and we don't discipline them, you know, they, they never learn and they never, uh, they, they, it could be very destructive. So for our own good, the Bible says that God loves us. So he, therefore he will chastise us. So this is a true doctrine, but they're, they're uh, thinking they don't know anything else. As you said, they don't understand the enemy, apparently. I don't recall any mention from the three accusers and now Elihu. I don't recall one time they brought up the possibility that it's the enemy, that it's Satan, that it's the demons, or he's under demonic attack. So I think you're really right. You just really nailed it. They don't, they're not even relating that as a possibility. Maybe it's not even in their, their doctrines. They're not even... Uh, uh, thinking of that as some kind of that that, that actually happens um, so uh, yeah, I, yeah when I saw the the video this morning I didn't watch the video it's but uh, I looked at the comments on it uh, and, and I was surprised how many people were were agreeing that job is so difficult to understand and I think this is the root of the problem uh, they're, they're not relating the whole book of job back 
to the original scenario that is set up in, in chapter one and chapter two. And therefore, that's why they're all confused because they don't have that perspective. All right, I'll go on through it. Uh, if you want to say anything else before I go through it slowly. Uh, okay, I concur. All right. Now I'm going to read it in the Amplified. Uh, Elihu continued his discourse and said, Hear my words, you wise men, and listen to me, you have, who have so much knowledge. For the ear puts words to the test as the palate tastes food. Let us choose for ourselves that which is right. Let us know among ourselves what is good. For Job has said, I am righteous and innocent, but God has taken away my right. Although I am right, I am accounted a liar. My wound is incurable, though I am without transgression. So um, let me get your response to verses 1 through 6 there. Now, uh, <clears throat> verse 3 stood out to me. And that was all I could think of the whole time was how he compared the hearing to taste. I thought that was rather profound myself. Does anybody else uh, get that impression? Anybody? Well, well, I, I, I thought it was a, a, a clever, clever way of stating it, but I, apparently I, I wasn't as impressed as you were, though. Um, so let me hear he's starting right off by, by saying the, the problem is Job uh, you're claiming complete innocence, and you, you're saying that, that God is doing these things to you, and yet you're innocent, and therefore that would make you, you're basically accusing God of being unjust. Now it says in verse 7, What man is like Job, who drinks up derision like water, who goes in company with those who do evil and walks with wicked men? Now, you remember that chapter where Job uh, uh, told about his life and, and, and the way he lived, actually lived his life? He denied all these accusations like verse 8, uh, that, that yeah. he did all these wicked things. Remember that? Yes. Yeah. So uh, are, they, are they just making up stuff about Job? Because they're saying he's 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 not treating the poor well. He's being unfair to not not taking care of widows. He's he's doing he's, he's a wicked man. And then he he talks about all the things he's done. And we concluded that truly Job must be the greatest man in the world. I mean, it seems to me everything Job said about the way he lived his life confirmed why God selected Job as the example. He said, okay. Satan, you've run around the world. You can't find anybody good, anybody that uh, really loves me. Well, have you have you met Job? Job, uh, Job is righteous. Job loves me. Check him out. And so uh, Satan says, "Well, the only reason he loves you is because you're, he's so blessed." Let me let me uh, mess with him, and, and he'll he'll end up uh, cursing you too. Uh, so I think Job really is that great. Uh, and and be, I think God chose him because G God recognized he was that great. And Job was aware that he's innocent. All the charges against him are false. And so is it, is it, is it a, a bad thing for, for someone to deny or defend themselves against all the accusations? Um, I think he's, he's um, it's fair and, and, uh, uh, he's justified in defending himself against these accusers. Um, well, before I go on, anything else you want to add? Well, look, uh, I commend his lawyers. They did an excellent job. Uh, I would hope my lawyers would do the same because uh, I don't want no milk toast lawyers, you know, kissing up to me. I want them to uh, be hard on me because that will just make me stronger. Okay, back to you. All right, I'm going to go on now. Let me see. Uh, uh, verse 9. For he has said, It profits a man nothing when he takes delight and is pleased with God and obeys him. 
Well, Job never actually said that. Uh, I don't remember him saying that one time. I think that you can kind of connect the dots and make a conclusion because Job is, has claimed that he's done all these righteous things. It says, it profits a man nothing when he takes delight and is pleased with God and obeys him. So uh, in other words, Job is saying, I, I've delighted with God. Uh, I've obeyed him completely. I've done all these things. Uh, and then, but it, it hasn't, it hasn't helped me because look at the situation I'm in. So in, he didn't say it in those words, but I can see how Elihu is, is uh, drawing that conclusion. Uh, before I go on, what do you say about verse 9? Uh, whether he said it or not, uh, he was using that uh, purposefully to accomplish a specific uh, uh, reaction from Job. Okay, this is it's a psychological technique in uh, uh, dealing. Uh, it's very deep. Uh, I'll have to get my lawyers to expound more on it. Okay, back to you. Okay. Verse 10. Therefore, hear me, you men of understanding. So, you know, he's, uh, this is Elihu being sarcastic again. Uh, he says earlier in a verse, uh, verse two, hear my words, you wise men, and listen to me. Uh, so he's really come to the point where at the beginning, he was very respectful to his elders, and he listened. And I think the way that he conducted himself was, was good. He, 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 he yielded to the elder, elderly men to do the talking. And then he finally reached a point where he was like so frustrated. And then he ends up deciding to tell them, you, wise, you old men are not wise at all. And I'm the one that's wise. I'm young, but I'm, I'm wise. I'm going to tell him the truth. And uh, he keeps, now he's unloading on Job, but he's also at the same time, continuing to insult the older men start with his sarcasm about their their wisdom he doesn't think they're wise at all according to what he said in the last uh chapter uh let me see therefore hear me you men of understanding far be it from god that he would do wickedness and from the almighty to do wrong okay well uh I think uh, we can agree with that. I mean, uh, that, that's why uh, I can't accept Calvinism uh, because Calvinism teaches that every every wicked thing that's done in the world, God is orchestrating and, do, and doing it. We're just puppets that he's controlling. He's making me sin. He's making me, uh, if someone murders and rapes and, and, and uh, uh, molests little children, God's controlling them and making them do it. That's Calvinism. And, if, if, and that certainly disagrees with this verse. It says, far be it from God that he would do wickedness. No, God wouldn't do wickedness. Before I go on to verse 11. Uh, absolutely, Brother Luke. So uh, it's good to see that uh, they could keep their sense of humor throughout the whole thing. I think he's just uh, employing uh, levity when he... Uh, denounces his uh, friends like that. Okay, back to you. All right, verse uh, 11. For God pays a man according to his work, and he will make every man find appropriate compensation according to his way. Uh this verse 11 here, I can see how this verse could have done an awful lot of damage to uh, this. This verse here could really send a lot of people through to hell because this is the, uh, the whole premise of all the religions of the world that you, God uh, uh, responds to you according to your works. You do good things, God rewards you with heaven. You get to go to heaven based upon all the good things you've done. And when you do wicked things, 
then God responds to that and you go to hell. Uh, that's that's never been the way it, it, it is. Uh, it, it, past, present, or future. If, if you're a dispensationalist and you think that God dealt with people differently through different periods of history, you're wrong. God's dealt with mankind the same way all the time. Uh, I have a video about, titled Dispensations, and it says, works never work. You could never work your way to heaven if you're Adam and Eve, if you're Noah, if you're Abraham, if you're Moses, if you're Job, anybody, nobody could ever work their way to heaven because nobody could ever work, do perfect works and they always fall short. Uh, all the great characters of, of the Bible, they were all saved because of their faith. And even Job said in an earlier chapter, he was gonna be saved because of his faith. God had already taken his sins and put them in a bag and sewn it shut. And it was because it was faith in God that he, that he saved. So uh, this verse here, though, it's only true in the respect of two things that apply to us in our years living on the earth here. Before we go to heaven, we are accountable for what we do in two ways. One is the law of reaping and sowing that Jesus and Paul referred to, and that is, when you do good things, you get good results back. And that's just even apart from God. You know, if, if I do nice things for you, you're gonna respond by wanting to do something nice for me. It's just it's just the way the, the world works. If I'm abusive and mean and dishonest to somebody, then uh, they're gonna they're gonna dislike me and tell everybody about me, and my reputation is gonna be ruined, or maybe call the police and I go to jail. There's consequences for your bad behavior, and there's benefits to your good behavior. If I eat properly and do my exercise every day, I'm more likely to have the result of good health rather than if I'm smoking and drinking and taking drugs every day, probably I, I will, I'm, I'm uh, sowing bad things for my health, therefore I end up reaping bad health. That's true for everybody, whether you're a Christian or a Muslim or an atheist or anybody, the law of reaping and sowing. We also know that in Hebrews, it says there's this concept of chastisement. Those of us who put our faith in Jesus, we're a child of God, so God will discipline us to try, try to help us learn our lessons. But this point in verse 11 here in Job, and there's other verses like that throughout the scripture that are taken out of context. They do not apply to salvation and going to heaven, but they do apply uh, to our lives uh, as I just explained. So it says, for God pays a man according to his work, and he will make every man find appropriate compensation according to his way. But we have a verse in that Paul wrote that says that uh, salvation is a free gift. It, it's not by, by works, uh, uh, it's, it, otherwise it would be uh, wages. It's not, you know, if, if, if you are gonna go to heaven based upon you doing good things, then it's like working and getting wages. You're being compensated for your good works. And then what that does is it makes God your debtor. If people could go to heaven based upon their goodness, then at the judgment seat, they would be perfectly justified in going before God and saying, look at all the good things I did. I did this in your name and I did that in your name and I deserve heaven you owe me you could boast before god but the scripture says it's not by our works it's because of our faith it's a gift salvation's a gift it's not wages that we earned through our our good works but this verse here a person could use that verse to justify in all the religions of the world verse 11. what's your response to that I can't believe that uh, you're so concerned with that. It's not even an issue in my book. I've already proclaimed that uh, the book of Job is not allowed to be used for making doctrines at all. Uh, didn't you get that memo? Everybody wants to... Uh 
uh, get their doctrines from all over the Bible, and they don't uh, they don't understand that point. And there there is truth in Job, as I said, that Job, the doctrine that is true in Job. Job did divulge to us when he said that he's uh, he, he trusted God, and that's why he's going to heaven. And, and his sins are already in a bag. So uh, Job has it right, but here Elihu has it wrong because he's. Uh, first of all, he's wrong because he doesn't know that it's not even God punishing Job. Okay, I'm going to go on to verse uh, 12. Surely God will not act wickedly, nor will the Almighty pervert justice. Who put God in charge over the earth, and who has laid on him the whole world? If God should determine to do so, if he should gather to himself, that is, withdraw from man, his life-giving spirit and his breath, all flesh would perish together and man would return to dust. If you now have understanding, hear this, listen to the sound of my words. Shall one who hates justice and is an enemy of right govern? And will you condemn him who is just and mighty? Uh, God, well, let me stop there, verse 17. Uh, it's just it's just more of the same where you have Elihu. Uh, as I said, he's not only accused Job of being wicked, but he's saying in addition to your wickedness, uh, now you're adding on top of that, uh, accusing God of being unjust. And I didn't really get that from, from Job. From what I got from Job, was confusion over why it's happening why is why is god doing this to me why is this happening to me he doesn't believe it's god doing it to him they're all wrong about that but uh he doesn't understand because uh he he, he doesn't think he's done anything he hasn't reaped bad badly and therefore he doesn't think he should be sowing badly so he, he he's confused about it but i don't think he's calling god unjust but he's questioning. He wants an explanation. Anything about that before I move on? Uh, more of the same. Uh, it's all clear what's going on here, and it's very uh, interesting. And soon we will be learning about God's response to all this, won't we? That's very exciting. I look forward to that. Yes, I do. I do, too. Okay. Uh, verse 18, God who says to a king, you are worthless and vile, or to, a prince, to princes and nobles, you are wicked and evil. Who is not partial to princes, nor does not regard the rich above the poor, for they, they all are the work of his hands. Uh, there sounds like a little Calvinism in their thinking there, thinking that... Uh, a person could really take that verse to think that God is controlling everybody, but he's the work of their hands and that he's created people, but not in the work of his hands that he's controlling them, like with his hands, like you control puppet strings. Verse 20, in a moment they die, even at midnight, the people are shaken and pass away, and the powerful are taken away without a human hand. For God, uh, God's eyes are on the ways of a man, and he sees all his steps. There is no darkness nor deep shadow where the evildoers may hide themselves. I, I do like these verses here. Uh, I've, I've often said that in street preaching, where I've talked about Sin City, you know. Here, I live in Las Vegas, Nevada. You know what the you know what the the slogan for Las Vegas is? They, what? They put, they, Wait, they, they, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. That's right. Yes, exactly right. Point, point. <laughs> they they want people point, point, point. basically. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna make a note. I give you a hundred bonus points on your tally sheet. But, uh, so Las Vegas is called Sin City. Uh, and, and, and 
they, they advertise come to Las Vegas and you can drink over drink and you can gamble and we we've, we've got uh, a lot of loose women here and prostitutes and, and and drugs and this is just a wonderful place for you to do the things that that you you can't do back home you can do it here and and no one will ever find out whatever happens in Vegas stays here we're not going to tell anybody no one will know uh, but there's two problems with that statement and first of all uh, all the cities of the world are sin city because if people live there sins in that city so Las Vegas they may be boldly proclaiming and boasting about it about the sin in Las Vegas but the other cities around the world they're, they're full of sin too except it's done more in secret here you can come and do it all publicly and, and shh, don't worry no one's going to find out but guess what God is observing God sees everything that we do he not only that even our secret thoughts he reads he can read our minds he's omniscient he knows everything all of our thoughts and you can go into a a dark corner of a room and do something and guess what God still he can still see and I think this verse here is pointing that out and I I, I do like that because um, not that uh, I like to harp on people's sins and try to make them feel guilty about their sins to come to Jesus uh, but but there are some people though that um, uh, they, they try to act like well they're they're a good they're a good person and yet we know what they're doing when they're all alone I mean I mean I can I can guess because I know the things I've done when I'm all alone and no one's watching we're all like that but guess what you can't hide from God God knows so if you think you're without sin, you're deceiving yourself and the truth is not in you, the scripture says. So that's the real point of, of harping on someone's sin is just to make sure them admit, admit it. You're a sinner, just like me, just like everybody. We're all sinners. That's why we all need the Savior. Very good, brother. Don't be like the brother that has a beam in his eye. And he's accusing the uh, guy in Las Vegas that has a speck in his eye. I mean, there's some terrible, terrible things going on in this world. A lot less than what you see that has been legalized in Las A lot worse than some of the things that have been legalized in Las Vegas. I'm telling you what. Okay, back to you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so... Uh, verse so verse 21 and 22 I'll read those again for God's eyes are on the ways of a man and he sees all his steps there is no darkness nor deep shadow where the evil doers may hide themselves he for he sets no appointed time for a man that he should appear before him in judgment now that I'm not really sure uh, the, there is another scripture that says it is appointed for man once to die and then the judgment. So the, those verses here, uh, let me see this in the Amplified. Well, it says verse 23. For he will not lay upon man more than is right that he should enter into the judgment with God. Uh, I think that they've made a big mistake in the uh, Amplified with that verse. Verse 23 in the KJV says, for he will not lay upon man more than right that he should enter into judgment with God. And then in the Amplified, they phrase it, for he sets no appointed time for a man that he should appear before him in judgment. Uh, I, I do think that's, a, that's a, a serious mistake to interpret it that way, particularly when we have a verse that says, uh, uh, God is a, uh, we're, we're, what was the verse I just quoted? We're appointed, uh, we're appointed once to die and then the judgment. In other words, we all have an appointment with death. An appointment means that there is a time that's, that's set. When you have an appointment, if I say, uh, I'll see you 
in the future. Uh, Brother Eric, that's not an appointment. If I said, I'll see you tomorrow night at 7 p.m. on the Internet, that's an appointment. That's a, a time. Well, we do have an appointment with God, an appointment. It is appointed for man once to die, and then the judgment. Of course, someone might say that that verse means it is appointed that for, for man once to die. In other words, God has decided that we die once. Uh, everyone must, must die once and then be judged. Uh, but maybe I'm being uh, emphasizing the word appointed too much. Uh, but I think God does know uh, the moment that I'm going to die. I mean, I'm, I'm sure he knows. I have no doubt at all that it's already determined, not because God determined it and established it that I will die a certain day. It's just because God sees the future. He knows how it's all going to play out in my life. He, he knows that, you know, if I was to go to sleep tonight and die of a heart attack, he, he's already aware of that. He's not making it happen, but he's aware of it. If, if, if I got lived for 20 more years and on a certain date that uh, I, I die, he already knows about it. He's not determining it, it, even though it is determined because he knows the future. He has foreknowledge. All right, well, maybe I'm harping on this too much, brother. What do you say? Yes, I'm okay with that. Okay, back to you. All right, let me go on here. Uh, uh, he breaks mighty men with iniquity. No, no, he breaks mighty men without inquiry and sets others in their place. Therefore, he knows of their works and he overthrows them in the night so that they are crushed and destroyed. Uh, this is another thing that... Uh, um, There's a lot of things I'm reading in here where I, I think Calvinists could grab it and use it. And I, 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 it all, I guess it all depends on the um, presuppositions that you have with you when you read things, the way that you're going to re respond to it. But I, I see this thing as, well, yeah, God does these things when he wants to. Uh, he, he's sovereign in the, in the respect that God is able to do whatever he wants. God is omnipresent, omnipotent, all-powerful, all omniscient, all-knowing. All um, is there another omni? Omnipresent, omniscient, omnipresent. Uh, but uh, so God is able to, to do these things that we just read in that verse. But is God actually controlling every single thing, every time someone dies, every time someone's overthrown, it's God's behind it? No. Sovereignty doesn't mean that God controls everything that happens. Uh, for example, me moving my hands like this, God's, God's not making me do it. I'm deciding to do it myself. God doesn't have me on a string making me lift my arms like this. God could make me move my arms like this if he wanted to. There's no reason why he'd want to uh, right now, I don't think, unless he felt he wanted to make me look, humiliate me for some reason. But if he wanted to humiliate me, he could make me do that because he's all-powerful. He's sovereign. He's able to do it. But because he's sovereign, he also has the, the right and the ability to say, I'm going to let man have a free will and, make their own decisions and, and, and do their own things. Otherwise, that way, that way they're accountable for their actions. If I control all their actions, I can't hold them accountable for it if I'm making them do it. So I'm going to give them a free will. That way they're accountable. And also, if I give them a free will, then I could possibly have a love relationship with them because uh, I, love can only happen if people do it willingly. They desire each other. Whereas if I force someone to love me, it's not love. What is it? If you force some, a woman to love you, they call it rape. And God's not like that. He's not imposing himself on us. He wants a loving relationship with us, but he desires it and he gives us the choice. We can desire it. We can, we can want it or not, or we can reject him if we desire it. Uh, so sovereignty of God just simply means that God is able to do whatever he wants, 
but he's also sovereign in respect that he, he, he can give us free will, let us do what we want, but he does intervene. And I think in a, a verse like this one would be an example of him intervening. It says, uh, he breaks mighty men without inquiry and sets others in their place. Uh, therefore he knows of their works and he overthrows them in the night so that they are crushed and destroyed yeah I'm no have no doubt that he does that when he feels that he wants to do it for for his purpose but he's not controlling every thought word and deed of every person and every moment of time verse 26 well before I go on do you want to respond to any of that uh, do, do you think it would be important for the viewer to understand why we have forbidden doctrines to be made from the book of Job. You're the one that has declared that, so I'll let you present present your case for for that. You, you don't see how the setting in the book of Job and the way that the conversations are being transpired. Uh, do not uh, make for good doctrine. Can you not see that? Well, if I was confused about Job the way we were talking about earlier, then you could person could de definitely uh, formulate doctrines that are incorrect. But because I understand what's going on, uh, I, I don't have any confusion about coming to uh, some uh, wrong conclusion and getting a, a false doctrine. Um, and that, that's, pro, that's the whole point of context. Uh, I think Job's a long book. And we're on chapter 34. Now, chapter 1 and 2 was a long time ago that we read it. But I still remember it. I'm still keeping that in context. I'm still keeping that in mind as I read everything else. And if people don't keep it in mind as they read everything else, that's where they're going to come to some, some bad and wrong conclusions and maybe come up with some bad doctrine because they, they're, what, look at Job and, and his friends. They're coming to some wrong conclusions. They all, all, all five of them think that God's doing it to Job. That's wrong. All five of them think that it's happening, be, except Job. Uh, the, the other four, they think that God's doing it for him to Job because he's wicked. Job says, God's doing it to me, but I'm not wicked. I don't understand it. It doesn't seem fair, you know? But I understand that, and I'm not going to come to a false a, a, a doctrinal error because I, I understand verse 1 and 2, how that affects the rest of the story. Go ahead. Now, there are great lessons to be learned from the book of Job. And when God himself speaks, we can make whatever doctrines we please from that. But now when the lawyers are conversing one with another, you cannot make doctrines from that. Okay, back to you. Yeah. Amen. Okay. Uh, let me go on here to uh, verse 26. He strikes them like the wicked in a public place. Because they turned aside from following him and would not consider or show regard for any of his ways, so that they caused the cry of the poor to come to him, and he heard the cry of the afflicted. When, when he keeps quiet, who then can condemn? When he hides his face, withdrawing his favor and help, who then can behold him and make supplication to him? Whether it be a nation or a man by himself. Well, that was very interesting. What's your response to that? Uh, could you read it again? <laughs> okay. Um, uh, verse, I'll start with verse 26. He, that's God, strikes them like the wicked in a public place because they turned aside from following him and would not consider or show regard for any of his ways so that they caused the cry of the poor to come to him and he heard the cry of the afflicted when he keeps quiet 
who then can condemn? When he hides his face, withdrawing his favor and help, who then can behold him and make supplication to him, whether it be a nation or a man by himself? Well, that's interesting that he uh, specified whether it be a nation or a man himself. Wow, that's just amazing. Does that strike you in any particular way that he mentioned those two? Well, I, I don't know if, I mean, uh, it's, it strikes me as, as uh, important to understand that this premise, this, this point that he's making here applies not specifically to just to individuals, but, but broadly to whole communities and nations too. If a nation withdraws itself from God, don't be surprised if God withdraws himself from you. But in this case, God hasn't withdrawn himself from Job, <laughs> you know? I mean, it's, it's, a, tr it's a, a, a real uh, valid point, except I'm sick of them applying this to Job's case because it doesn't apply to Job's case. God has not withdrawn himself from Job because Job's wicked. And God's... Well, they're, supposed to, they're supposed to do that. Brother Luke, they're supposed to be hard on Job. Job wanted it that way. All right, let me go on. Third, verse 30. So that godless men would not rule, nor be snares for the people. For has anyone said to God, I have endured my chastisement, I will not offend anymore. So uh, here, of course, this ch word chastisement, that same word is used in, in uh, uh, the book of Hebrews, as we, I've cited a couple of times already, that it, it says that as a child of God, because we're his child, it's his duty to chastise us because he loves us and he needs to correct us. If, if, he, if he wasn't chastising us, uh, it would mean that we're not his child. We're not, he doesn't care about us. So here is the principle of chastisement is, is on verse 31. And it is, it, it's a true point. So see, Elihu has a lot of truth in, in what he's saying. Just like the other three, there's a lot of truth in what they've said. But the, the error of everything they're saying is trying to uh, uh, apply it to Job's circumstances. Okay, verse 32. Teach me what I do not see in regard to how I have sinned. If I have done wrong, injustice, unrighteousness, I will not do it again. So the idea of, of uh, asking God, let reveal to me, I, know you, I, I believe you're chastising me, uh, what I've done wrong, reveal it to me. Let, I, want to, I want to know how what I've done and correct. I want to correct it. I don't, I don't want your chastisement. I want your forgiveness. That, that's all valid, valid points, except it doesn't apply to Job's circumstances. Verse 33, shall God's retribution for your sins be on your terms because you refuse to accept it? For you must do the choosing and not I. Therefore say what you truthfully know. Men of understanding will tell me. Indeed, every wise man who hears me will, will agree. Job speaks without knowledge, and his words are without wisdom and insight. That, that one verse really pisses me off right there because he's saying Job speaks without knowledge, and his words are without wisdom and insight. He's the one that's speaking without knowledge. Job doesn't have knowledge of what happened, what's really going on either. But he's Elihu is speaking without knowledge. But they just, they're all ignorant because they didn't read chapter 1 and chapter 2. Verse 36, God, Job ought to be tried to the limit because he answers like wicked men. For he adds rebellion in his unsubmissive, defiant attitude toward God to his unacknowledged sin. 
He claps his hands among us in open mockery and contempt of God, and he multiplies his words of accusation against God. I don't know about you, brother. I'm, I'm getting really upset at these people for what they're doing to Job. I mean, could you imagine? Uh, my, my life is, I've never had to suffer the way Job's suffering. But I, I have suffered. And sometimes I've had so-called friends treat me the way that these people are here treating Job. And I, I, I can identify to a certain extent. Much, much Job's sufferings up here, mine's way down here. But I, I have no people like these guys. And uh, it, it hurts bad enough to go through something and be suffering, and then to have someone, your friends, turn against you. Hold the phone, hold the phone. Don't you see what's going on here? What? Their accusations are so ridiculous. They're just trying to cheer Job up. Don't you see Job laughing his head off at these ridiculous accusations? No, I don't see him laughing at all. I haven't heard him laugh one time. But uh, it is absurd because it, it's all untrue. Job knows how he lived his life. Gave, Job gave us an account of all the things he did. And I was impressed. Weren't you? God was impressed. God's the one that said, out of all the world, I'm choosing Job. Go go look at Job and you'll see. There, there is a righteous man. There is someone who loves me. And, and, and uh, I don't know. I just... Uh, it's just like pouring salt onto his wounds. Not only is he suffering all these losses, but he's also being falsely accused. And that really, it really, it's just really getting to me. I can't wait till that part's over and we move on from this. I'm just going on and on and on with these. Uh, I like my theory better. It's a happier theory. What's that? I like my theory better. It's happier. Okay. Well, that's the end of this chapter, chapter 34. We'll go on to chapter 35 uh, next time. But let's end this broadcast the same way we end all of our broadcasts, uh, on a positive note. We want to tell you the gospel. And the, the word gospel is a Greek word, and it just literally means good news. So we want to tell you good news. <laughs> Matter of fact, this news is so good, it's great news. It's so great. It's the greatest news ever. You interested? The good news is that God offers you eternal life in heaven as a free gift. Woo! Are you... If you believe that, you should be jumping for joy. But of course, you probably don't believe it. But what if it was true? What if God said to you right now, I'll let you go on to heaven as a free gift. No strings attached. All you got to do is trust me. Don't try, to, don't try to get there some other way. Just trust me completely and I'll get you to heaven. Wouldn't you be happy? Wouldn't you be exhilarated? Well, it's true, and uh, I'm going to post in the in the comment, uh, not the comment, in the description box of this video, a, a, a statement of faith declaring the basic premise and concepts of Christianity and also verses that support it. So I want you to go through that and read it very carefully, but I'm going to sum it up very briefly. This is what we call biblical Christianity, or what I call Christianity, the type of Christianity that is based entirely on Christ and not on ourselves. Christianity that's based on Jesus Christ, who he is and what he's done and, and his promises, not on what we do and our ability to be religious. That's the 
Christianity you find in the Bible, biblical Christianity. The kind of Christianity most people have heard about their whole lives is what you hear in most churches, especially if you go to the Roman Catholic religion. They're teaching you something that's not biblical at all. They're teaching you that in order to go to heaven, you have to behave. If you behave, God will reward you and give you heaven. But biblical Christianity says it's not based on behaving, it's based on believing. Believe on Jesus Christ, you go to heaven. Now, if you want to go to heaven some other way, like, let me behave, let me follow all the rules, let me do good deeds, and then when God judges me, he'll say, well done, you get to come in. But the Bible says in Romans 10, 3, establishing your own righteousness to get to heaven, is not that's man's way, it's not God's way. God's way is trusting Jesus and relying on his righteousness and his good works to get you to heaven, not your own. So the Bible says that uh, um, salvation, eternal life, is a free gift that's offered to everybody. You can't earn it by doing good works. You can't earn it by being charitable. You can't earn it by being religious. You can try, but I'll tell you the standard you've got to meet. Let's say this is perfection. The Bible says, we all fall short of the glory of God. The glory of God is Jesus Christ. He lived a perfect, sinless life, and he set this example for us. Now, if you want to try to achieve what Jesus did and live a perfect, sinless life, oops, it's too late. You've already sinned. <laughs> too late for you. You're not perfect. But if you want to try by joining religions and doing religious things, you're going to fall short. The Bible says we all fall short. So good luck. If that's what you want to do, if you want to try to earn heaven for yourself through your own efforts, good luck but you're doomed to failure. If you can admit that it's impossible, the way Jesus said it was impossible. His apostles were listening to him and they said, well, geez, what, based on what you've been saying, how is it possible for anyone to get saved? And Jesus said, with man, it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. See, it's impossible for you to get to heaven through your own striving and effort and your own goodness. But with God, it's possible. And Jesus' name translates to God saves. He is God who saves us. So stop trying to work your way to heaven and give up and say, I can't do it. I need to be saved. I need a savior. There's one savior. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man come up to the Father but by me. Could you imagine? What if I said something like that to you? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one cometh unto the Father but by me. You'd, you'd think I was crazy or egotistical, maniac, or a liar. Well, that's what some people thought about Jesus when he made the claim. That's what some people think about him today. He's a liar. He's a lunatic. Or you can, do, you can conclude the way Brother Eric and I have concluded. He's our Savior God. He's the way. He said he's the only way to go to heaven. You need to put your faith in him so you can either trust him and, and rely on him to get you to heaven, or you can say, no, he's a liar. I, I'll, I, I, there's other ways. I'll do it my way. What will you do with Jesus Christ? That's the question. Now, would you, if you do put your faith in Jesus, he gives you eternal life at that very instant. And he says, uh, he holds you in the palm of his hand and no one can pluck you out. He says he'll never leave you or forsake you. Salvation is irreversible and irrevocable. Once you believe in Jesus, you never have to worry about losing it, that he'll turn his back on you and take it away. You've got it and you're guaranteed. You will be, you're guaranteed you're going to go to heaven if you'll just trust Jesus now. Will you do it? Now, if you just said yes to that question and you believe on Jesus now, you're trusting him, uh, you should be the happiest person in the world right now because you should know, you're assured, you're going to go to heaven when you die. If you're that happy, don't you think you ought to thank him? Brother Eric, what, what, what do you think they ought to 
say to Jesus now? Well, Brother Luke, now that you're saved, you can know for sure that God is listening to you when you pray. So let's go ahead and pray and thank him for his great gift of salvation. And we can know for sure that he's hearing us. Okay, dear Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for our sins and being buried and rising again the third day to give us eternal life with you in paradise. Boy, what a blessing. Thank you for hearing our prayer and for loving us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, guys, I highly recommend that you go and always love your neighbor as yourself. Okay, back to you. All right, brother. Okay, this was a, kind of a fun chapter, but it also it kind of got my my anger up a little bit. I'm just kind of I'm getting really fed up with all these guys and, and the way they're treating Job. But uh, it's been a lot of fun so far through 34 chapters, and we got a lot of good stuff ahead of us. Okay, Brother Eric, thank you for joining me as usual and uh, uh, viewing audience. Uh, thank you for watching. Join us nightly, 7 p.m. Pacific time. Bless you in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.